Well, despite the the issues we've been having, um, from my point of view, uh, this is uh, very similar to what Arthur C. Clarke uh, said uh, when he said that any a sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. From my point of view, but despite the fact that I can't see your video right now, I'm pretty sure I'm coming through. Um, I find this rather amazing. I would not have expected uh, when I started working on open source and free software that it would be possible at all uh, for me to give a talk uh, in India uh, from my house on the West Coast of the United States uh, in uh, on a late evening uh, uh, on a Saturday night and you all hear me there at your Sunday morning. It's pretty amazing to me that we have this level of technology. I think, uh, at the moment, one of my biggest concerns is that we are in a world where that technology has become so interesting to everyone, so exciting to everyone, because it has changed the world. Uh, we've forgotten about a lot of things that I think are pretty uh, dangerous and problematic that have happened uh, throughout uh, our world with regard to technology and its use. Uh, so from my point of view, like notwithstanding the problems we're having, we, I, I, as you, some of you were, uh, how many were at the conference last year? Can you raise your hand at this conference? Um, were any of you at, the, at my talk last year for this conference? Um, looks like not many. So, um, so, I, so I, I, I think this is just amazing that this can be done. And I think that the fact that open source and free software has made that possible um, is actually a tribute to how much amazing things we've been able to do as a community uh, for, with with software. But this didn't come. This came at a certain amount of cost that I think is problematic in our culture. When I got first involved with free software uh, in the early 1990s, it was a very different technological world. Uh, certainly, the internet was not ubiquitous. Uh, it was. Uh, uh, difficult to find internet access. And uh, many people who were engaged in what was the early free software community were actually uh, a very small subset of the people working uh, in technology at all. And those people had discovered uh, what was a burgeoning uh, internet and a thing we had in those days called Usenet uh, community that allowed for a certain type of collaborative work that didn't exist before that time. It allowed for people at different organizations, different universities, different companies to work together on projects. The interesting thing about why that was so successful was because there was at the same time a political movement uh, in the field of technology that was focused on the question of what rights and guaranteed assurances people should have when they got copies of software. So people have begun to think about the moral and ethical questions of the rights software users should have with regard to software. And over a period of time, people writing about it uh, began to come up with four essential things that were really important to users of software. The right to copy, share, modify, and redistribute software became the important rights that folks concluded people should have. Now, I entered the free software world just as this idea was formalized and just as people were beginning to collaborate in this way on online communities. And they had legal tools already to do that. People had created a thing called free software licenses. These licenses were designed to assure those rights to copy, share, modify, and improve software. And it allowed people to begin this work of collaboration, begin this work of working together to make software better and be usable by everyone in ways that had not been done before. Now, in those days, the number of computers in the world was quite small. There, in fact, weren't very many people who had their own computers yet. So the, the utility of that software freedom was admittedly relatively limited. It 
was in some sense a privilege for those few people who were in incredibly privileged position to have access to computers, which meant you worked for a large corporation or a university of some sort. But the interesting thing, as people began to run software on their own computers, as people began to get uh, PCs in the mid 1990s, uh, and they became ubiquitous, and those PCs began to get ubiquitous internet access, uh, at least in many parts of the world, the free software movement grew to include a lot of people who were in fact hobbyists rather than professionals in computing. This was the era of free software that was of most interest to me. It was of most exciting to me that I could get involved with a community that was interested in technology as basically a hobby. That to me had always been my hobby. I was training as a computer scientist to become a professional software developer. Uh, but while I was a student uh, and my early days in my career, I was much more interested in what I could do as a hobbyist with computers than I was what with might happen professionally. I got involved very early with Linux uh, and downloaded it in the early 1990s in part because I wanted more control of my own computer. I was already rather uh, obsessed and excited with the idea of software freedom and the right to copy, share, and modify, and improve software. But I discovered that uh, the, the, the benefits of being involved in a collaborative community that was uh, not necessarily commercial, and it's not that free software prohibits commercial activity. In fact, it's very important in free software licensing to treat commercial and non-commercial activity equally. If somebody wants to use and deploy and improve and modify free software commercially, they have equal rights to those doing it non-commercially. But the people doing it as hobbyists, the people who were making interesting things with their computers because they were excited about what they could do in their homes uh, with their friends, that to me was the most compelling part of free software. It's what got me excited about what was happening. But the other interesting thing that was happening during that era was free software was, despite being heavily used in companies, it was very much counterculture. People who were using and improving free software as part of their company work often had to do it surreptitiously. There was this uh, joke that people used to tell in the 1990s uh, when Linux uh, first became very stable and uh, a system called Samba, which is uh, a SMB server, which could therefore replace Windows NT file servers as early as the mid-1990s, the joke went that uh, if you were a good sysadmin, what you would do is replace all the computers uh, with uh, uh, all the Windows NT servers with Linux boxes running Samba and not tell your, your boss because they would never approve such a change with this crazy Linux thing that you downloaded from the internet uh, that wasn't from Microsoft. But in fact, uh, Linux and Samba would make your job easier and you wouldn't have all the headaches of trying to manage and, and run Microsoft systems. So that kind of counterculture of free software is really what drew me to it. It's the reason I became a free software activist because I saw the democratization of technology in a way that was not true in the early software industry of the 1980s that I first became involved with. I realized that professionally I might end up in that industry, but I liked computing because I thought it was exciting. I thought it was interesting to make good things happen on computers and make people's lives easier by having things automated on computers. And so I wanted to do that in a way that was uh, in a community-oriented fashion. And that's what drew me to free software. Now, I think the reason I tell these old stories is you know, an old guy just randomly telling stories about his old days, because I think the, the world of open source and free software is very different today than it was when it was created. We have the remnants of all these projects. Linux, of course, is the most widely used operating system. It's probably running on most of your mobile phones as well as all the servers we're connecting through. Uh, to, to talk uh, today, but it has this different culture now that was not the culture that created it, that fostered its creation. Linux was created as a hobbyist project. 
Uh, it was a hobbyist project for most of its history. It was only in the late 2000s when companies realized that they were actually running all these Linux servers that sysadmins had installed through the 90s and not told their bosses. It was only in the mid 2000s when companies realized that Linux was so well designed and so uh, interesting as a development model that it might actually work for commercial products. You don't see Linux in commercial products until the mid to late 2000s. It is a counterculture movement up until that point. This has had a tremendous amount of impact on the community that I see around me in open source and free software. Some of those impacts are positive and some of them are negative. I think the positive impacts are relatively obvious. It, it is true today, and I, I lost your video feed, so I can't, I was gonna pull the audience to ask how many of you expect to get jobs uh, when you finish at university working on open source software in some way. I think many of you probably will. Many of you will, if you don't work on open source full time, you'll have some part of your job that either uses, uh, you know, consumes some open source technology and builds on top of it, or in some type of way interacts with open source technology. And that is certainly positive. Uh, one of the things I found so demoralizing in my early career was the idea that I had to support and make function proprietary software for the companies that I worked for without access to the source code. I fancied myself someone who was good at software development, and I think generally I was. And I felt that if I could fix the bugs myself, that would be substantially more efficient than begging a vendor to fix bugs. I spent most of my early career in the 1990s while I was off being a hobbyist on my nights and weekends, uh, my day job was always calling vendors to ask them to fix bugs in their software. I found that that was most of what it meant to be a professional software developer. You spend more time on the phone filing bugs with Microsoft or any other company that you were dealing with than you did actually trying to develop new software or improve any software because you were constantly stymied by the bugs in proprietary software. Companies, I think, have realized this as well. They've discovered that there are certainly certain types of software that they would rather see be released under FOSS licenses if they can be. And they've concluded that they're going to allow in their companies certain types of technology to remain FOSS. So that means that there's these huge advantages. You actually get to collaborate with people across other organizations, companies around the world working on software. Most software projects uh, that are open source and free software have contributors from every country in the world. Where there's anybody writing software, there are people there, if it's a popular enough project, working on that software, improving it. This is a huge benefit. The fact that the industry has accepted FOSS as an inevitability, at least in some areas, has made the lives of developers substantially better. Um, there are also some of the best developers in the world uh, who were early adopters of these projects who get employed full time to work on those projects. Also an amazing and wonderful thing. And I think it's better culturally to have people working on FOSS than have people working on proprietary software because I believe in the moral imperative of giving people rights to copy, share, modify, and improve software. But this isn't all just perfectly wonderful. I think we live in a world where when companies are left to their own devices, they've done a tremendous amount of harm to society. We see this all over our culture around the world. Globalization has meant, generally speaking, that for-profit companies, many of whom are based in my country in the United States, have been able to, in some sense, force their will upon people around the world. Uh, to the extent to which, at this point, uh, Facebook is controlling the way people in my country, at least, think. I don't. I hope. I hope that Facebook has not impacted India as badly as it impacted the United States. But we're in a bad state. Uh, with regard to that here in the United States. And I think worldwide, having technology companies have the power and create these power silos that allow people 
allow you know certain people to control uh, propaganda, media, all that sort of thing is very dangerous. Now, Facebook is is a wonderfully interesting example because every server inside Facebook is Linux. Facebook employs a tremendous number of open source developers who contribute to projects that are, are freely available and uh, in source code form and give all the rights that I would insist uh, on as a free software activist. Yet they are a dangerous company and using technology in dangerous ways and ironically using this free and open source software in ways that I find tremendously dangerous and disturbing. I think the same is true with lots of things that are happening on Android devices. It's very easy for us to say as free software activists, well, the problem is Apple and the iPhone because it's such a lockdown platform and the Android flat platforms are at least are based on open source. But there's two very disturbing things going on there. First of all, while Linux is under a license called the GNU General Public License, the GPL, which is one of the FOSS licenses that works to a great extent to defend users' rights and freedoms, we find that on most Android devices out there in the world today, the copy of Linux that is on that Android device does not actually comply with the GPL. Users who get that Android device do not have the ability to recompile and reinstall Linux on their device. But what's worse is even if they had the right to do that for Linux, all the other would be open source software that's part of the Android open source project as it comes out of Google is usually turned into proprietary software completely legally because Android, uh, other than the Linux portions of it, are not under the GPL. They're under a non-copyleft license, a license that while it offers software freedom, offers the user the right to copy, share, modify, and distribute, and improve the software. It does not guarantee that right for everyone downstream from the original distributor. So when Samsung gets a copy of Android, Samsung's often doing two things. One, they're making a proprietary Android st stack based on the AOSP project. And in some cases, they may not even be giving the source code to Linux like they're supposed to. And if you look back in the history of the organization I work for, the Software Freedom Conservancy, we actually had to sue Samsung to get them to release source code for one of their devices because they had refused to. So th these problems are incredibly dangerous to where free software goes forward. I think we're in a moment of what people in social justice movements often call co-option, where the basic tenets of a movement of the people are adopted by the people in power and incorporated into their way of working, but not to the extent to which the original activists sought to reach. So we have companies willing, very willing, in fact, to adopt open source technology, as they would call it, and incorporate that into their corporate structure, but they limit the open source software that they're willing to create and they limit the open source software they're willing to adopt. And they're not necessarily willing to abide by the licenses that are there to defend users' rights and freedoms. So this is a complicated thing. So when I tell young people like yourselves who are studying at university, thinking about becoming uh, software developers, I say, you're entering a world that is much more complicated than the world I entered. Uh, I had pretty much two choices when I entered the field. I could write proprietary software, write and support proprietary software. I did a little bit of that early in my career and hated it. Um, or I could somehow find a way to get involved with the stuff that I was doing as a hobbyist and turn that into some sort of career. And it was a harder road to try to turn that into a career. In the end, I became a professional activist, which is a little bit strange to me to this day, rather than a software developer, which I was pretty lucky to have opportunity to do that. But if I were entering the field today, I'd enter a rather weird situation because even with my beliefs of being a fan of software freedom and people's rights to copy and share software and improve it, I could easily find, and I'm sure, I, I suspect many of you will be able to easily find a job that will at least let you do some of that, will at least let you participate in some open source projects. And not only that, but many of the internal processes that software companies now use are 
modeled around the type of systems that free software has produced. So Git, for example, which is a GPL uh, software tool for distributed version control, is now the industry standard for how people do version control in not just open source and free software projects, but in proprietary projects as well. Yet another irony that I find where you look at something like GitHub and realize two things are true about GitHub that are really disturbing. One, GitHub itself is a proprietary web application, mostly proprietary software. It is simultaneously though, the largest hoster of open source code and its primary business model is selling its services for private repositories for companies that would like to use Git and GitHub in a way that allows them to develop propri secret proprietary software. This is the kind of thing I mean when I talk about co-option. We have companies that are willing to participate and engage in FOSS and software freedom, but only up until a point. Up until the point it interacts in a negative way with their business model. I personally have, uh, I, I encourage you if you feel like it to watch a talk uh, that I gave uh, last week uh, at uh, FOSDEM, which is the largest uh, free software uh, conference in the world uh, in Europe each year uh, in Brussels, Belgium. My colleague and I, Karen Sandler, gave a keynote there uh, last week where we talked about our own struggles with trying to use only free software. There was a time in the early 2000s when I could have said, every piece of technology I use is 100% free software. Even as I talk to you now, everything in front of me is running only free software. I use a laptop that's uh, made by Lenovo, that's uh, an X200 that happens to not just run uh, Debian as its operating system, but also has a completely free software firmware in its bootloader and is free all the way up and down the entire stack, including all device drivers and firmwares for all the peripherals and so forth. Uh, the thing is, is that's a 10 year old laptop at this point. And there is in fact no modern laptop that you can get that does not have some proprietary software either in the bootloader or in some of the peripherals and so forth. When you look at mobile applications, as I talked about, there's Linux, which is free software. There's Android, which is technically free software, but in most places where it's deployed, it's not. Uh, and almost every application that you might run, including the most popular ones, such as Google Maps and so forth, are proprietary. And we have noticed, my colleague Karen Sandler and I, that we're in a world now where it's harder every single day to use only free software. Yet, every single day, there is observably more lines of open source code than there ever has been in history. This is a strange paradox. And the reason I think this paradox exists is related to that aspect of corporate co-option. Companies are willing to put resources into certain types of open source projects. They have gone to a moment where they say, well, there are certain types of infrastructure we've agreed as an industry should be open source, but we're not going to open source everything we do. We're not going to make decisions of open source by default, as some people claim happens. That doesn't actually happen. It's proprietary by default and only in the cases where you can make a business case to one of these companies that open sourcing will benefit them, will they make it something that's going to actually be free software for everyone to share and use and improve. So I, I, I spend a lot of my time relatively pessimistic these days. I don't know how to tell students anymore, you can resist and you can build an infrastructure and a world without proprietary software. I don't know if that's the world we have right now. We have a world where companies are mostly in control of the technology we use, and we don't have a lot of choices that are very easy. And at the same time, many of the things we fought for have been co-opted and incorporated into the way corporations work. So it's very easy to lie to ourselves when we go into these companies and say, oh, they're doing open source. They're doing, look how much open source they're doing. Well, there's a lot of everything going on in every type of company. and most of it is not open source and software that's shared and improved by other people. So I, I think a lot about these kinds of questions. Another thing you'll hear a lot about now currently in 
free software policy discussions is this word sustainability. And it's very interesting that that conversation is happening because one of the tenants, one of the assumptions of that conversation is that free software should work just like proprietary software does. We should be able to fund developers with at the same levels of salaries, at the same types of uh, business models uh, that make sense for proprietary software. And that this is some sort of lamentable problem that free software isn't sustainable because it's not funded in the same way and it's so difficult to fund. There are two points that I like to bring up about that uh, in conversations. And when you start hearing about sustainability uh, in open source, I hope you'll think about these two fundamental points when you hear about it. The first is that free software is always at a disadvantage against proprietary software by default because of the way the system already works. The system is in some sense set up to make proprietary software more easy than free software. And the reason is, is, that, is that software is not necessarily proprietary by its nature. The reason you can create proprietary software that doesn't give users the right to copy, share, and modify, and improve is because the legal system, most notably copyright, but other legal systems as well, permit you to proprietarize it. Copyright is not a natural right. It's not a thing that exists in the world by nature of being a human being. It's a legal construct that we invented as culture, and now it's globalized through a thing called the Berne Convention, which basically every country in the world is now a signatory of, says that when you make a work of authorship, which is what software is, when you type the code into a text editor, you get the permission to restrict how other people copy, share, modify, and redistribute it. In fact, the GPL, the first copy left license, was designed specifically to flip those rights around, to create a situation where by default, the copyright power was used to assure your right to copy, share, modify, and redistribute. And one of the reasons Linux has been successful is because it's under the GPL and because it assures people's rights. And that there is a way in those cases I talked about where someone fails to give those rights to users, a copyright holder can use the copyright system basically against itself to liberate that code. But this is exactly why it's harder to do free software than it is to do proprietary software. Because this legal system is giving you all this power by default when you create proprietary software. So it's not surprising at all that people in open source and free software communities argue constantly about, well, how do I make money doing this? Why are business models so difficult to, when I make it open source? Well, the system was already stacked against you when you went into it because the system was stacked to make it easy to make a business around proprietary software. And free software is ultimately that counterculture. It is the thing trying to answer and undo proprietary software. So it's no surprise at all, to me at least, that it's a heck of a lot harder to make a living doing free software than it is doing proprietary software. It doesn't mean proprietary software is better. It just means that as a culture, we made a decision we decided that proprietary software was some sort of moral good. And we made that decision without even debating it. We just applied an existing copyright system, the one made for books and movies and everything else, to software and considered it to be the best way to go. And that's something we should be questioning as a society. And it's why there's such a sustain one of the reasons why there's such a sustainability challenge. The other reason I think this sustainability debate is problematic is that it makes an assumption about what types of way we should build software. Um, I, I hope that in uh, India where you are, there's not the same kind of cultural attitude that I find in the United States and in Europe um, with regard to how software ought to be created. Particularly here in the United States, we have a huge problem uh, with the Silicon Valley mindset controlling how software gets built. This idea that if you create a software company, it shouldn't just make money to pay its employees and keep running, but that it should make so much money for their, the investors that they'll be wealthy beyond anybody's wildest dreams. This idea that you have to create a company, not just that gets 2% growth every year, which if you think about any other type of business, if you, if you were to open a restaurant, for example, 
and you were able to say, wow, I'm running my restaurant and I have 2% more customers coming to my restaurant every year. I pay all my employees and the restaurant runs great. Most people would see that as a successful business. In fact, uh, it, it's generally considered very difficult to start and open a restaurant and have it be able to succeed. Uh, most restaurants, at least here in the U.S., uh, fail uh, in their first year, something like 70 or 80 percent of them. So just getting to the point where you're paying your employees and you have people coming to eat and enjoying your food, that's considered success in that industry. In software, that's not considered success. If you build a software company that employs five people and does something interesting with free software, the software industry tells you that's a failure because you're not an acquisition target from some big company. You're not going to create billions of dollars of wealth for your investors and you have no chance of doing so, therefore you fail. And this kind of culture in software is incredibly disturbing. And as I look um, at, where, at, at India, where there are so many incredibly talented people developing software, I, I beg of you, do not allow your technology industry there to imitate the one that we've done in the US because we've done it wrong. here, And it's not the way that software ought to work in my view. I got into software because I wanted to help people. I wanted to do things that made computers do good things for people and make their lives a little bit better. Um, I don't think most of the technology that we get offered actually improves people's lives. I don't think Facebook is improving people's lives. I don't think GitHub's improving people's lives in the way that it's doing its business. So I, I, I encourage you to think about ways, uh, obviously when you're looking for your first job, when you get out of university, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a very different thing and you may have to take whatever job you can find and I wouldn't fault you for that. But as you get further in your career and you get more options, think about what kind of software you're creating, who you're creating it for and how it's licensed. And is it actually software that's going to create communities that bring people together? That's fundamentally what I think was special about software freedom that I think our culture is losing. So often now people talk about how your GitHub page is your resume and your job is to contribute to these projects so that somebody will hire you to do some sort of job. The communities that get created um, often are incredibly similar to software teams inside companies rather than being communities of people that include everyone. And that everyone comes from a number of different the one that was most interesting to me when I got started, which I've talked about here, is the community of hobbyists and professionals. To me, I felt I wanted to be in a culture where the hobbyist, the person who was doing it because they loved it, not necessarily because it was their job, could interact with people who were doing it professionally on equal footing. That was what was most important to me, uh, in part because I was a privileged individual and you know, had lots of opportunity myself. That was my focus. But we have other problems too. One of the big cultural problems we have is a lack of diversity uh, in FOSS contribution. Uh, it is certainly true that when you look at FOSS projects, they are heavily dominated by people um, in the United States and Europe. Um, I think we make great inroads uh, into South America, but when I look at the number of people in India and the number of incredibly talented people in India who can contribute to software and compare it to the number of contributors we have in open source and free software, it's substantially less. And I think that that's a wonderful opportunity um, for all of you to be involved because we, we need that diversity and it will, it will improve our behavior <laughs> and our way of looking at the world if we have a truly global environment in FOSS projects. The other thing that we have very problematic in our community is a lack of diversity with regard, uh, not just nationality and not just uh, that kind of uh, background, uh, but we are incredibly male dominated uh, field. And in fact, FOSS is more male dominated than even the larger technology sector. So if you compare a general technology numbers to FOSS, we find that the gender gap is much larger in FOSS, and that's incredibly problematic. We at Software Freedom Conservancy run a program called Outreachy. It's specifically designed uh, to get people who are coming from underrepresented groups in FOSS to get involved. And where we believe it's a big part of FOSS sustainability to not just require people to contribute as volunteers, which that whole GitHub page as your resume thing is centered around this idea that you're just supposed to volunteer time. And if you 
have, if you're privileged and you have a lot of free time, that's wonderful. That's how I got involved. But most people are not so privileged and they don't have tons of free time. There are lots of people who have to work uh, a job while they're getting their computer science education all around the world. And they don't have time to contribute to a project. So what we do in Outreachy is we offer paid internships for people to contribute to FOSS projects. And specifically people who are coming from underrepresented groups or otherwise have faced substantial hardships uh, in their, um, their goals to get involved with software development and technology. And so we run that program twice a year. Uh, in fact, there are, uh, 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 there are many people from India who participate, uh, particularly in the summer round, uh, the, the, the global north uh, summer round, I should say. Um, so that's the, the one that goes from, uh, from, I believe it starts in June and goes to August. Uh, and uh, we've been very, very excited that so many people from around the world have participated in that program. And we've gotten many people now who are alums of that program, who have been through the Outreachy program, who now are major contributors to free software projects. They've been able to get jobs, contributing to those FOSS projects as part of their jobs. Uh, and they've also mentored other people in this program uh, going forward. Uh, and that, I think, is an incredibly essential aspect. I don't Want, I, I believe that many of the problems that I've talked about that we have in FOSS actually stem from this lack of diversity in these problems. And so with that, I think I want to kind of wrap up. I hope that I've had some interesting things to say about where we're coming from in FOSS and what's happening uh, now. I've covered a lot of different issues, so I'd love to just take some questions. I'm hearing on IRC that everything's fine. Uh, yeah, hi, Bradley. I hope you can hear me. I have a question for you. I can. OK, fine. Uh, so Bradley, before I ask the question, I'd like to add a few points which you had said about the contribution from the India um, with, the, with respect to the developer perspective. Uh, I agree what you say uh, is perfectly right. But I'll tell you the root cause is actually basically it's a cultural issues. Our academia is majorly not very open. Secondly, over here, students' team culture doesn't exist. You know, that's why the project lifetime they get in, they get introduced and involved, but they, that you know, project never carry on in a longer term. That's why you know we don't have a substantial contribution coming out of it. And we are discussing this time in this fast meet that you know can we solve this problem at academic level? Now I'll come to the, my question, and the question is uh, uh, is related to the uh, like we have earlier era like copy uh, left thing. Now people are talking about copy fair licenses, where uh, even anybody who adopts your uh, free and open source software, they are far more uh, committed towards the community in terms of cooperative, cooperative type of world, where they have to share the wealth with them. Then that, you know, what are the things right now we are seeing that monolithic organization like Facebook or Google or anybody, if they have a power because the wealth is actually considered at one place. Okay, if the wealth get distributed to the, all the people, uh, whoever the contributed in a, in, in a fair manner, then I think that problem will go away right now, what we're seeing as side effect of Facebook maneuvering the lot of things in terms of, you know, our policy as well as in uh, democracy. Okay, so now my question is, what is the chances and what is the, what is the, uh, what is the moment uh, behind a copy fair and how we are going about it in terms of promoting copy fair licenses uh, the, in, in a free and open world. So, so I'm, not, I'm not that familiar with the term copy fair. I've heard people use it in different ways. What, 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 what do you mean by that when you say it? Can you, uh, yeah. can you give me a little more detail? Uh, uh, yes, uh, yes, Bradley. I hope now you can hear me. Oh, it sounds great now, yes. Okay, fine. Uh, see, uh, uh, we had an era that when we uh, came from, a, uh, and we created a copy left license in which GPL and other things are there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now we are talking about a world where uh, uh, the corporate uh, companies are not going to be monolithic companies. We ah, are going to be in cooperative world. Okay. So let's say now if we have to be in a cooperative world, it has to be supported by legal frameworks, right? And one of the legal yep. framework, uh, like Linux succeeded or all this succeeded because GPL and the copyleft license was there. There was framework mm -hmm. around it. Similarly, now we are talking about a framework where the copy fair licenses are there. You can copy, you can share, and you can do it, but you have to distribute wealth also with contributors, okay? Then we will not have a monolithic culture of companies coming up, okay? Then, then you know, all this currently, what are the symptoms we are seeing it? Uh, the company becoming super, and they are controlling a lot of things, and they are forcing a lot of things to us. Moment a contributor becomes as well as a stakeholder. The point is contributor should become stakeholder also, and 
uh, that has to be handled at a framework level, which is called copy fair licenses. Yep. And one yep. of the interesting work is my P2 Foundation, and they are doing documenting about it. So my question is this one, how where we are now with respect to those type of licenses, where wealth is going to be distributed with the people and cooperative culture comes. Thank you. I, I, I think it's, uh, I think the, the, the fundamental part of your question, which is most interesting to me, uh, and you, you are referring to a framework that I'm not that familiar with. I'm, I'm going to take an action item to go do some research on it because I, I don't know, I don't know that much about the framework you're talking about, but the general point that you're making is really, really interesting and important, which is we, we don't, uh, we, we don't know for sure that the legal frameworks we had to defend the rights of users in their software actually work. It's certainly true and ob obviously correct that, that copyleft was not good enough to stop a lot of bad things that are happening. Here's a great example. So you look at something like Facebook and say, okay, Facebook is complying with copyleft licenses generally. Even if we had a Faro GPL'd everything, Facebook probably could have still built their business model in the way that they did. And the types of negative effects we're having from Facebook having control of people's conversation around the world is incredibly bad. And there's no licensing structure I can think of or have ever heard of that can, could have actually prevented that. Like we sort of go say, well, what if we had done this as a legal framework? Uh, would that have prevented that kind of situation? Uh, I think probably we don't know what legal frameworks we need. And I think it's a great thing that people are actually having the policy conversations of how we build these legal frameworks uh, to, to try to solve those problems going forward. The problem we have is that we're so late in realizing the problems that we would never have expected that companies like Facebook and Google and everybody else would exist and want to explore. I didn't, I didn't think they would ever try to make some sort of half measure like they did and, and interact with our community and actually become a part of it and co-opt it in the way that they have. So it wasn't really easy to predict as an activist that this was going to happen. And who knows what companies are going to do next when they, they interact again with these, these kinds of uh, these kinds of communities as we're going forward. So we're, we're at a, we're at a like fundamental disadvantage going in because they have a lot more resources than activists do. And we also don't actually have a plan uh, that like we did 30 years ago. I think one of the biggest problems we have in software freedom today is that we don't have a plan how to combat a lot of scary things that are happening. When you look at things like, um, another great example is, is you know, AIs that are being programmed and controlled by big companies, right? I mean, Google has got us all training their AIs for them. Every time I log into something, it wants me to train an AI to figure out how to identify cars or something else, right? So it's this weird situation where we're part of this whole ecosystem that, that, that these companies have created. We're helping train their AIs that are then marketing products back to us. None of that stuff is available freely as technology. Um, if we had the source code to the AI training system, would it even help? That's an interesting question, but I think probably the answer is it's a, it's a necessary but not sufficient condition to address the fact that, that, that these, these AI systems are gonna have such a large part of our lives going forward. Um, so there's just these massive problems uh, that we're facing and we, we, our policy frameworks that we developed are, are kind of almost risible in their level to respond to what's happening in technology. So I, I know that's a, like incredibly like doom and gloom, like pessimistic answer, but I, I think we're in a pretty pessimistic spot. And so, and so I, think, I think it's great that you want to think and talk about policy frameworks, but I think we have an uphill battle that's really hard to climb. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Bradley. But uh, I have a one input uh, over here, which I feel, you know, uh, I agree. Th now we have a monolithic uh, still companies like Facebook and other stuff. But uh, I see still a good sign. At least people are adopting free and open source software. It's a, it's a one stage we reach uh, 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 prior to what we were earlier. But now we have to go to the next stage as it's here. Yeah. yeah. See, what I mean to say is actually, uh, see, I'm not saying that uh, what are the currently is, is a pessimistic state uh, with respect to the companies are, uh, uh, you know, uh, controlling a lot of stuff. That is the wrong thing. But in terms of adoption of free and open software, we have reached a stage where people are adopting in their own way. But we have to go to now next stage from copy left to copy fair where the distribution of wealth is done to everybody. Then that monolithic culture and the control will automatically go away. That one stakeholder becomes supreme, and there is a huge dis a disparity between the distribution of wealth. 
then all everybody will become stakeholder as a cooperative then i think things will work perfectly fine I, 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 I hope you're right. Let's, let's put it that way. I, I, certainly, I certainly hope that there is a, a I, I've been kind of trying to read about copy fair uh, you know, while you've been talking. Uh, I mean, I, it's, it's an interesting policy framework to me. Uh, I'm glad folks are working on it. Uh, whether it's going to solve all the problems, I, I, I admit that I'm, uh, maybe I'm just pessimistic by nature, but I'm dubious that, that any one solution is going to be a silver bullet. I think that's a mistake we made uh, with copyleft, I think I think we looked at copyleft early on as oh, if we design this policy framework right, it'll solve all the problems. But but it's it's tough to anticipate what what your opponent's going to do if they if they have a lot of power. But but I agree with all the principles you're 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 saying. I agree completely that that having people uh, having individuals have more equal rights uh, in the software freedom culture generally is really important. And it's something we have to fight for. Um, we would probably have to debate offline, like what what, what yeah. policy frameworks might work. But I, but I'm glad people are working on them. Yeah. And I think it's a yeah. good thing. Thank you, thank you, Bradley. Thanks. So basically, you said that if you were to run a restaurant and it made like two percent growth a year, it would be successful. And we've recently seen in the uh, industry that uh, uh, industry giants like Activision and uh, EA are uh, shipping games on. Uh, I recently had an uh, example that Battlefield, it sold 6.3 million copies worldwide. EA considered it a failure because it didn't sell 7.3 million. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah, it's uh, that. Uh, so what I feel like is that this type of culture raises is it uh, rewards those who are already big in the industry and punishes those mm -hmm. who are trying to come up. And how do we combat that? Um, I, I, <laughs> if I if I knew how to combat that, I would have given you a whole talk, just giving you a tutorial on how to do it. I, I wish I had a solution. You know, I, I, I feel uh, it, you know, it's it's tough it's tough to be a leader sometimes because uh, people look to you and say, well, you know, I uh, ask questions like this, and and I wish I knew how we combated that. I, I think the best thing we can do is being incredibly mindful about what's happening. Um, so I, I think a lot of people ha you know, have your attitude and, and look toward it and say, how am I going to make my mark in this industry when these kinds of problems are ahead of me? Um, and I'm very sympathetic to that. And I think, I think that uh, what, what you have to do is when you end up taking some other job because you weren't able to start your own company for whatever reason, um, just be mindful of where you're at and, and, and really kind of push uh, in small ways, because because it's difficult. I, I I often give this thought experiment where I say, well, look at look at look, look at what would happen if every single software developer in the world went on strike and said, I won't write another line of code uh, that's not licensed under the GPL or or any other you know copy fair license, whatever it is, right? If we if we made a decision to say, oh, everybody's going to boy going to go on strike until they until 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 the industry changes, everything would change overnight. Um, now, that's it's just a thought experiment because we're never going to get the entirety of every person who has the ability to write code to agree on exactly what the demands are and go and strike together. Um, but the reason that's an interesting thought experiment is it, it, it proves that collective action still works, that if large groups of people who understand technology are unwilling to let the technology industry go in certain directions, it cannot go in those directions. And I think, I think that I, I often am amazed, uh, sort of negatively amazed, that software developers, people who are, who are good at understanding how computers work, don't understand the power that they have. Our society runs on computers now. Uh, everybody has a mobile device in the industrialized world and everybody uses it all day long. It means the technology runs our lives. And the people that build that technology have a tremendous amount of power. And that technology doesn't get built by venture capitalists. It gets built by the people venture capitalists employ. And all of you are going to be some of those people when you finish your university and go to work. So you're all, every one of us is a little tiny part of what can make the change happen. Um, and the best way to combat it is to is to be collective in your discussions, to participate in the larger policy conversations like we were just having with the last question, to 
be willing to tell your employers, I'm not comfortable with what we're doing. I know that's a difficult thing to do when, especially when you're young and you have got your first job and you don't, no one wants to lose their job over disagreeing with their employers. But uh, if enough people are willing to disagree with their employers, it's a lot harder uh, for employers to, to push people around and say, well, if you won't do exactly what we say, we won't, we won't pay you to write code. Um, I, I also think that uh, not writing code is okay sometimes. You know, I, 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 I don't, I think if I were starting out today, I would have a lot of discomfort entering the field as a software developer. I might choose a different field or different job, job altogether just because I didn't want to participate in the larger system. So that's, I know that's not, that's not the best advice in the world because it's painful not to work in the field you want to work in and you're t talented towards. But uh, I think it's something to think about a lot and important to think about. Hello, Patrick. My question Hi. is specifically regarding the way you talked about inclusion and uh, uh, the lack of diversity. I've been a person who tried to advocate uh, regarding the importance of diversity in many sectors, um, which includes the software sector also. The major problem that I face in this around is that uh, people, the privileged people are not able to understand that we need to give representation to the minorities. And uh, they are not able, uh, the major issue that is faced is that uh, people usually compare others with a scale of merit, which is absolute. They are not understanding that uh, a woman is facing a different battle or uh, in specifically in India, we have an evil system called caste, which is a, a class-based hierarchy of people. So they are not able to understand that uh, the absolute scale of merit or the way we are comparing people by seeing who is the best presently is not a fair way of comparison. So is there any way uh, or any methods that you guys are following out there to um, let the privileged people know that uh, we have to use a relative scale and we have to give representation even if somebody is relatively poor in doing what they are doing. Yeah, it's. I, I think it's. I mean, I mean, we. I know the problems in India are, are different, uh, and I'm familiar with the, the caste system in India. Um, uh, uh, you know, as, as much film familiar as someone can be who's not who's uh, you know from from an, from another place. But uh, but the problems we have in the U.S. Um, are are not really. Um, that different from what you're describing. Uh, it, it, there is still a tremendous amount of sexism in the United States. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of um, assumptions people make uh, about your background, uh, both economic background as well as uh, as, as as racial and, uh, and and gender background and so forth. So so it, so we're just in the very beginnings of dealing with this problem. Uh, one of the reasons why it's so much more difficult uh, we found in FOSS, uh, as opposed to the sort of generalized uh, you know, industry, uh, is in part because of a, a myth that got created early on. And this idea that, that it's, it's kind of this idea of a, of a FOSS perfection, as if, as if we had perfected uh, our way of organizing people to work together in FOSS, and therefore, we know anything that happened in FOSS was okay. Uh, and this whole idea that we have in free software, going back to the basically the late 1980s, early 1990s, that the projects operate in some sort of meritocracy, meritocracy, that if someone's in charge of a project, it's because they were better than everybody else. And if someone's high up, it's because they were a better developer all along. And we've discovered that just is a, a fiction. And I think being able to tell people that you believe that's a fiction, and and me as someone who's I mean a privileged white male uh, living in the living in the United States, like I, I just have so many check boxes of privilege that I've been given. One of the things I've tried to do when I'm in a privileged situation, and since it was a, it sounded like a, a man's voice asking question, I, I lost my video again by the way a while back. Um, but but if you're if you're a man. Being able to say, I, I think that this culture around me is sexist and being willing to say that to people um, and say, hey, I think that this is an unfair system that we have and we have to reconsider it. Just saying that much makes a huge difference, even if it doesn't make any immediate change at all, because you're, you're identifying for people that there's a problem and you see it. And those kind of simple comments 
um, stacked up with lots of people making them. That's what brings change over time. Um, and, and, and it's not, there's no easy solution to immediately bring change because even here in the United States and, and in other places where, um, where we're, we're trying to do this work, it's just as difficult. And we have, we face lots of obstacles very similar to the ones you're facing. So, so it just little actions are the ones that matter the most uh, the, in this kind of situation. Hello. Um, so like my question, the question that I had is like, as you said, firmware. Um, so uh, you said that you're using a laptop that's 10 years old, right? So well, the reason is like uh, the Libre board and stuff like that. It is not very mm -hmm. support. Yep. Yeah, it is not very supportive on your like modern laptops and stuff. Even uh, most like the harder vendors are not supporting all the open like open source of free. So what do you think about its future? Like e even right like it's closed. The harder vendors are not giving support. Even right now I'm having a huge difficulty just to set Linux on my system because again these hardware vendors are not giving like uh, as you said it was better back then like with yeah. So why do you think it's going like this? It should improve, right? It, it should, right? I, I, I think I, I think it relates to this co-option thing that I'm talking about. I, I think um, I, I think we had a better shot uh, and things were easier when we were a truly counterculture movement. Uh, when it was something that no one else uh, wanted to anything to do with it, that was that was in in companies. Um, now, when you look at the larger companies, that many of which are promulgating these proprietary technologies, you know, companies like Intel, like Qualcomm, uh, so forth, uh, um, ARM, um, these companies are. Are, are, are willing to adopt Linux, I and mean, they have to because they, 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 they depend on it now, um, but they, they are trying actively to, to put up barriers uh, for free software. They're trying to find the maximum stuff that they can pro proprietorize. In the past, it was actually an easier way to convince them because we could say, well, look, if, look at all the benefits you're going to get from adopting Linux. And slowly these companies said, hey, oh, we're going to adopt Linux and we're going to contribute to it. And all got better over time. Now, the, the companies in power are saying, well, wait a second. We know we can't live without Linux now. We know we can't live without a lot of different types of FOSS technologies. But we don't want our entire power structure to collapse underneath us. So we need to actively find ways to block 100% free software. And that's why I think we're seeing so much more resistance on the peripheral edges, because those were the things that we were still like kind of in the, in the mid 2000, late 2000 era, we were still kind of working on. It was slowly getting better. You know, it's around the time my laptop was created. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the, there was there was a, some interest in, oh, maybe we could live with, you know, everything being free software. Maybe it wouldn't be so bad. And that was the moment when these companies came in and said, actually, we want to control these open source communities because we only want certain amount of stuff to be open source because they know that they have an easier time making money if things are proprietary. Um, and we also have the whole patent problem that interacts with it, which is a, I didn't really cover that. We don't have time to get, to get into that deep, but there's all these places where um, generally speaking, companies have discovered, oh, if I, if, or if we as a company block this, we'll make more money. And if we, co-opt the open part of stuff that helps us and block the things that doesn't help us, we're going to be in a much better situation. It, it's, it's kind of a, it, it's, it's kind of like, imagine if, uh, I, I, I make an analogy. Imagine if you were working in some sector of, of work, it doesn't matter which one, and the companies involved with it had no idea that governments might be something they had to interact with. So if they said, oh, well, you know, we're not, we're going to ignore the, like we have in the US, we have a tremendous amount of political corruption. Companies lobby Congress to get all sorts of laws passed that basically benefit them. But imagine if the tech industry had said, oh, we won't even pay attention to that. We're not going to bother. Well, in fact, if activists had went to the government and said, well, actually, we want more regulation on the technology industry, we'd be at a huge advantage because they wouldn't even be bothering to lobby. So that's kind of what happened in free software. Free software was so counterculture. The Companies didn't even bother to figure out what was going on with Linux. The fact that Linux developers were reverse engineering hardware and getting stuff working and all that sort of stuff, companies just outright ignored it into the late 2000s. And so it was easier to catch up to them because they were ignoring us. And now we're at this moment where they're not ignoring us, they're actively entering these FOSS communities and trying to push them in directions with money and power, like 
big powerful corporations too. So we're at this moment where it's like, well, well now we have to fight them on basically equal ground and they have a lot more money and power than we do. So it's that's why I think it got harder. Uh, I think some people will probably disagree with me about th that, but I think I think that's that's kind of the, the the timeline certainly matches up and it's certainly the case that when you're being ignored, it's a lot easier to get things done than when you have somebody coming in trying to trying to block you in various places. Hello, uh, 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 Mr. Bradley. Uh, I guess you can hear me. Can you? Yes, I can. Yep. Okay. I can't uh, see you, but I can hear you just fine. Okay. Uh, you talked about uh, for like uh, you know what is it? Uh, FOSS being a collective of like you know people with interest, right? But the thing is, mm -hmm. when you go with like you know a big collective and all, they have like different what do you call it? Different goals in their minds for a specific project, and uh, like you know, um, in like when I when you go to Linux and all, um, here Linus has the you know what is it? The final word in what what gets into his operating system or not. But when you go for some other like you know uh, play uh, like some other projects where there might not be a hierarchy. Is there a uh, is there a possibility of ha the software having a you know uh, what do you call it like uh, having a bad representation or like you know being uh, what do you call it um, being uh, represented as a much worse version like we know that P two P right peer to peer networking uh, what is it like it was supposed to be like um, uh, a way to actually like send information using computers rather than servers and stuff. So, uh, um, like, after that, what happened was that that became a privacy problem. But um, because, like, uh, people were not just using, like, uh, before corporations were using this for, like, transfer movies between countries and all. And now it became a huge privacy concern and stuff, right? So, uh, like, uh, we know that the softwares are good. But uh, how do we, like, uh, focus it and how does... Uh, like, how do we, uh, like, um, do we need to have a hierarchy in each of the open source projects to actually have this kind of, what do you call it, like, uh, a goal in mind for the software, for the future, I guess? I yeah, I... I, I think it's a, it's an excellent question. Your question really kind of goes to uh, this thing we talk about called governance in, in FOSS projects. Um, I think one of the mistakes, certainly I made, I think a lot of people uh, who are leaders in, in FOSS made this error early on, that we thought uh, that the license of the software would be the only governance document we ever needed. Like I, I used to believe that if you GPL the project, that that would solve all the governance problems because the GPL gives equal rights to everyone and everyone who contributes has a right to the source code and therefore they always have the right to create a forked version. You know, so you, if you don't like what, uh, the, theoretically speaking, if you don't like what Linus and the rest of his lieutenants are doing with Linux, you could make a fork of the Linux project and, and go forward. I think what we didn't understand, um, and I'm sorry to, to keep bringing back to the same message, but I, I think it's, it relates in so many places. We didn't understand that companies were gonna come in and try to control these projects. And if you look at who the leadership in Linux now is, they're being funded um, by the companies that have an interest in Linux now, including Linus himself, who's funded by the Linux Foundation, which is uh, ultimately a, a, a trade association of a conglomerate of, of for-profit companies that have an interest in Linux. Um, and so, and so I, I think that that's a really dangerous way to run a project. I don't think we should have our FOSS projects run primarily by people employed by companies that have an interest in what happens in the project because it biases uh, the the leadership towards uh, towards what those companies want. I mean, I, it's just like like happens in in uh, in a in a legislative or political process where you have lobbyists um, who who give money to political candidates and then they control uh, kind of what they, not not in a direct way but an indirect way they influence uh, how how things happen. So I think we have problems in not just Linux. I mean, it's easy to use Linux because it's this big project and it's, it's a popular example and it's one everyone knows. But I think if you look at almost any project, um, they struggle with these problems. We, we've seen in our work at Software Freedom Conservancy, we've seen um, projects, we actually had to ask projects to leave because uh, their struggles with that stopped fitting our model. So one of the things we do as an organization is we create a place where projects can exist and have better governance that is more egalitarian, that is more uh, more equal among the parties involved in the project. Uh, but it's a constant challenge because they're always uh, in a project becomes some set of 
powerful people who are connected to some companies that are making money from the code base. So it's a constant struggle. I, I think what we need to do as a community is we have to really, early on in projects, write better governance documents um, and really have frank conversations about who's in charge and, and who they're being funded by and, and, and what their agendas are. I think too often we've pretended that software development projects are not political processes. Uh, but they are political just like uh, politics is uh, you're running a country or running a, running a, a city. Uh, and we should treat those politics as real and we should expose them. Um, one of the things I complain a lot about is um, there's actually kind of no free press in FOSS. Uh, there, there are very few people who are funded to act as journalists to write articles about what's happening in FOSS projects because there's not a, a market for it, so it's difficult to get people funded to do that. But because of that, a lot of weird politics that happen in projects that I know about because I'm, I'm in this community, they never get exposed because there's no journalists coming around digging, asking questions like good journalists do. Um, and so that's a, a, in fact, if people want to do a volunteer thing that would make a big difference as FOSS is, is start writing articles about, you know, doing investigating journalism about FOSS projects. I, I don't, I have no idea how you would fund such a project, but if you're interested as a hobbyist, it certainly, it certainly is something that's sorely needed. Uh, and, and I think, I think until we have those kinds of, that kind of scrutiny on leadership of projects, um, these kind of hierarchies you're talking about are going to, uh, sometimes become corrupt and sometimes become problematic. I don't think it's, but I, I want to be really clear, going back to your original point of your question, I don't think having a hierarchical leadership of some structure um, it has anything to do with FOSS, really. Uh, it's something that people tend to do when they work collectively. We see it in, in throughout human history that people create hierarchies. Um, but it's not inherent to FOSS. Maybe it's inherent to the way human beings interact with each other. Uh, but there's no specific reason that FOSS needs that kind of structure. And we do see projects um, that operate somewhat more anarch 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 anarchistically uh, than, than these hierarchical projects. So I, I, I think that if anything has the ability to kind of separate from that kind of tendency towards hierarchy, it would be uh, software freedom. So I, I hope more people will take advantage of that. Uh, 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 I understand that. Uh, like, you know, having a hierarchy is maybe not the best way to do it, but not having a hierarchy might cause fag fragmentation in a project, right? So, of like, course, of course. It's, like, it, I mean, that's, and that's true of any, of any situation. It's why anarchy doesn't work as a, a government <laughs> process most of the time, uh, yeah. because you do have that kind of thing. So yes, I agree with you, but I, I, think that, I think that it's incredibly important for people to question the hierarchies that are in front of them and, and, and really take them to task. Yeah, and also that, uh, like, as much as I love, like, you know, Linux and stuff, the, uh, like, the thing about Linux is that it's very fragmented when you go there. Like, uh, there's like the choices that they have is overwhelming. Like when you go mm -hmm. for all this stuff, right? So like, if they had a focus, how do you think the Linux, uh, what do you call uh, the Linux community would have grown? Would that been? Would it have been better? Or like, I know that Linux is was, was actually created for like server operating systems and so, and mm -hmm. all. But you know, as a desktop operating systems, it's very fragmented in the market and stuff. So uh, mm -hmm. what do you think about the future of Linux as a desktop operating system, as a potential desktop operating system, if uh, this fragmentation was not there? So I, I, it's, hard, it's hard to think about what an alternative history would be like. One of the reasons uh, fragmentation exists in FOSS is because of software freedom, right? So it's very, it was very easy for Microsoft to create a monoculture in the 80s and 90s uh, because they were the only, they were the primary PC operating system, and they had absolute autocratic control over all of it. Um, Apple has done a similar thing with the Apple devices. Um, the, there is no fragmentation in the Apple market whatsoever because Apple controls everything. I think the downsides of that are so huge that it's not worth the upsides of having everything work perfectly together because it works perfect. Excuse me. It works perfectly all together until it doesn't. Until you want to do something Apple didn't anticipate, and then you have no software freedom or rights to change it. So I, I think the fragmentation is is kind of a an outgrowth of of software freedom. It's it's a it's it's why democracy is messy, right? It's it's one of these things where well, if, if you're going to have the ability for people to lots of people to have voices and listen to lots of people when they give you feedback, 
um, as you do in a democracy, uh, it's going to be a very messy process and it's going to be very difficult to get things done sometimes. Uh, so I, I'm not too bothered by that. The thing that troubles me most about, about Linux adoption is that the, most users of Linux have no idea that they're using an operating system that gives them software freedom. And there's, I talked in my talk of a couple of reasons why that happens. Uh, there's other reasons as well. But when somebody gets an Android device, I want them to have the ability to install an alternative firmware, to be able to run a different version of Linux if they want, all those sorts of things, because I think that's kind of software freedom if it were in the hands of the people. While I agree with you, it would make things even more fragmented, I think it would have a democratizing effect that we're not seeing right now, that we really ought to be seeing because Linux is GPL. And, and I'm probably out of time, so I can't really get into more details about why that is, but some of my other talks uh, that you'll find online do cover it if you wanna hear more about that. Uh, hi, Bradley. So I have Hi. this question. You have mentioned about corruption and for corruption in companies using open source. So regarding the Cambridge Analytica ex revelations uh, in US and how Facebook has really used the data to mm -hmm. really control people, has this improved the people's sense of understanding that uh, about the need of freedom in software, about the way the the, the company is actually having this control over their data? Has it improved free software in any way? I just want to know how it's the situation is. I, I, I wish I could say yes. I, I really do. I, I think it, it, unfortunately, it kind of hasn't. Um, in part because, um, because of the, the kind of things that I was talking about in my talk, where, where you have all these companies are actually participating in many of these projects. Um, is that if, so imagine if, if Facebook were to release every line of code they had as FOSS tomorrow. Would it change all that much? Well, it would change a lot. It, it would allow people to build their own alternative to Facebook and so forth. But we still haven't solved the decentralized social networking problem. There's lots of interesting projects like Mastodon that have put a lot of effort into trying to build decentralized social networks using free software. Uh, but it's a hard problem. It's much harder than centralizing it all with one place. And you have all these economic incentives to centralize all the data because that's how Facebook makes all their money is by selling ads to people because all the data is centralized. So you have this weird perfect storm that the technologically easy solution can exploit free software and also make all these problems that we now see um, in, in Facebook controlling all this data. So, so it's really hard uh, from a free software perspective to come and say, it's not like we can say, if everybody switched to Mastodon tomorrow from Facebook, the world would all be fine and everything would be good. Mastodon would probably uh, collapse as a distributed infrastructure. Um, there would immediately be you know, tons of people violating the Affero GPL that would need to be dealt with and so forth. So, so I, I, sadly, I don't think um, we've been able to succeed as activists in explaining what, how the Facebook problem would be helped. It goes back to this po point I made before where releasing the software as 100% free software is a necessary but not sufficient condition to solve a lot of these problems. I, I think that we're never going to have um, good treatment by companies that control our data until all the software is free software. That much I, I believe. I, don't, I also don't believe that releasing this free software is, this, is, is the whole solution. It's just the first step um, towards the solution. So because of that, and because we, we have so many things up against this that we have to, to fight one by one, it's been very difficult uh, to convince people. I think what you find here in the US, just to kind of give you a sense of the way people have reacted um, to the revelations about Facebook, so many people in the United States um, just don't have, feel they have another option. Um, we're a very big country where lots of people live far from each other and Facebook changed the way people interact in, in, in a lot of positive ways. And so many people are, are so deeply connected to that. The fact that they can stay in touch with people that are thousands of miles away that they you know, know from their earlier parts of their life and still have a relationship with them. That's so compelling to people that it's actually very difficult to explain to people this tool you're using to do that wonderful thing is causing all these other horrible things to happen. And, and we don't have a good narrative to help people understand that, notwithstanding that people know, uh, generally speaking, that how bad the problem is. They just, they just feel like they can't live without Facebook. And that's, that's a really scary thing, that we've gotten to the point where people are so dependent on these that are problematic that we have to talk them out of using them to even get anywhere. 